going on everybody? You see a Jaguar back here with GenJag.com and I have a very special guest with me. One of the original 10 Jaguars to ever sign a contract with a team. Former guard out of Penn State University, Greg Huntington. What's going on, man? I'm good. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it was always my goal. You mentioned being part of the original 10. I actually tell everybody I'm the original Jaguar. I tried to be the first guy to sign the actual first contract, but when the original 10 flew in that day, I was actually number 10, truth be told. But uh, I, still, I, tell, I still tell people I'm the original Jaguar. Yeah, we'll reverse that around. We'll say you're number Thank one. You. So the first Jaguar to sign a contract. There you have it. So I hear you a lot on 1010XL, and you got a commercial for advanced disposal. You call yourself the Mangler. Now, uh, where did that originally? Because I know when I hear the Mangler, it doesn't sound like someone I want to piss off. So can you kind of tell me where that thing uh, came yeah, from? Yeah, I'll do my best to be brief and amazing on telling that story. It has nothing to do with my physical prowess on the football field, unfortunately. Although I'd like to think I was a Mangler as an offensive lineman. But I was one of the first guys to move into the city of Jacksonville. And I started to go on the Lex and Terry show. I don't know if you're familiar with Lex and Terry. They were kind of radio host. And they had me on quite a bit. And, you know, I was on there doing interviews, but they were giving away movie tickets to the Stephen King movie, The Mangler, based on his book, The Mangler. And I had taken their radio engineer, Howie, I think his name was, and I had actually picked them up and stuck his head through the <laughs> office tiles. And they go, you kind of look like a Mangler, right? <laughs> and so it stuck. And then all my buddies like Burnell and Baselli and all the guys I played with heard them call me The Mangler. And so it just stuck. And even my locker nameplate down in the stadium was Mangler 66. That's awesome. So when it comes to, uh, because I remember hearing Tom Colvin kind of talk about what his first, what it was like when he first started on the job. He basically drove down a dirt road into a portable and had like a little office and he just kind of went to work. Now, obviously you were on the very first team. So what was it like going from an organization like the Redskins at the time to the Jaguars and starting off a new franchise. Like, what was that whole thing like? It was really a dichotomy because when I went to the Redskins, I was at I was with a team that had been together since the '80s. They had just won the Super Bowl in '91, um, which was unique, but um, very different from going to a new uh, franchise team. And especially Tom Coughlin being his first time as a head coach, I think he really. Whether he went overboard, but we clearly, it was um, it was very stringent. Um, and I think training camp for us was even seven weeks long, which typically five. But we played five preseason games because we were in the Hall of Fame game. So we, well, even before the Hall of Fame game, we showed up in Stephen Point, Wisconsin, two weeks before even our first game. And I remember doing conditioning in full pads, whereas in the past you could at least strip your pads off. But that was just the way Tom was. I mean, he was really a stickler for the details and really bringing an accountability and order to everybody. So it, it was a unique situation, um, to say the least. Yeah, about to say, I mean, the NFL was obviously completely different back then. I mean, you had two days and mm -hmm. you're even putting on pads during like OTAs and now halfway through the season, they only put their pads on for practice. So it's funny the way the CBA kind of worked out this time around. <laughs> yeah, it's really, I say it's like club med for these guys, but you're correct. I mean, we used to even have three a day sometimes because you'd have a full pad practice in the morning then if you had any kind of special teams, that was midday, and then you would have a, an afternoon practice. So sometimes it was three days, um, and it was bad. Even like to your point, even OTAs. I remember being almost full speed. I mean, I remember having a shoulder injury, you know, because we didn't even have pads on and we're going full speed. So much has changed, and it's probably needed to be changed, especially in light of you know we're now realizing the head trauma and those kind of stuff. So change is always good in that regard. Yeah, so next I kind of want to ask you about uh, the godfather, Tom Coughlin. A lot of people have their different funny stories about kind of the way he does oh, things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember Jeff Loughlin talking about how he wore a boba tie, and the next thing you know, he changes the dress code for the team. What was your favorite Tom Coughlin moment? I, I'm glad you asked this because nobody ever asked me this question. I so badly want to tell my story about my, my, my best Tom Coughlin story. So uh, we're out on the field, and we're stretching. And I was on my back, and so a player was stretching my hamstring. I was going to hamstring stretch. Well, Tom came over, and he looked down at me, and he looked at the guy stretching me, and he looked down at me again, looked back to the guy stretching me, and he goes, you know Huntington should be 300 pounds, but he's 295 because he wants to be pretty for the ladies. <laughs> but that was Tom. I mean, Tom wanted you to be at least 300 pounds, if not bigger. And he always had a way, forgive my French, of busting your balls or being hard on you, uh, to get his point across, I and mean, that—that's—I mean—that's a classic Tom Coughlin story. Always finding some way to kind of dig you on something. 
Yeah, it's funny because he always kind of throws around backhand accomplishments. I remember Blake Bortles, when he was cleaning out his rock room after the last game, he came up to him and said, hey, that was a really good first half you had the other day. And then just his kind of backhand accomplishments is always pretty funny to me. Going back in the 2017 season, what do you think led to the Jaguars really having their really good turnaround that year? I mean, I attribute it again to Tom Coughlin. I, I really thought it was going to take him two years in order for his culture um, to take, but it really, I mean, it took place in just a year. And, you know, Doug Marone, I, I, you know, I think he's cut from the same cloth. It's just Tom's methodology um, of accountability. I mean, yeah, these, these are young players. And I, and I hate to say anything about the previous administration, but, you know, Gus Bradley, who I met, and everybody says he's a nice guy, when I heard the players under Gus Bradley saying, we love playing for Gus Bradley, I go, that's your problem. Because the head coach isn't there to be your friend. These are young guys making a lot of money that need structure and they need accountability. And Tom comes in, it's the little things. Hats off in the house, no eating in the team meeting room, cell phones away, all that stuff, all those little um, actions you know, play out on the bigger scale. And so I, I attribute all of it to Tom Coughlin, and yes, through you know, through Doug Marone as well. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting with the way Gus Bradley did things. It's because he always alludes to after the games is getting better and mm -hmm. uh, all that kind of stuff. But when you accept, when you accept just getting better, you're kind of accepting mediocrity in all the ways. And I think Gus Bradley, his philosophy would have been a lot better for an older team, a veteran team, just because you got a bunch of young guys on the team. You gotta, you gotta be tough with them. That's exactly what. Uh, Doug Marone and Tom Coughlin kind of do. I mean, people were saying they were walking around with um, eggshells when Tom Coughlin was there. And obviously, uh, he brought a team back together, and all of a sudden they go from uh, 3-13 and 13 to a 10-16 and 16 into the AFC Championship game. I mean, the talent looked like it was there, but they were really able to turn it around. Yeah. But next up, I want to ask you, you know, Blake Bortles. Obviously, he's had a four-year sample size. It's been really up and down. Um, I want to ask you, what are your thoughts of Blake Bortles and his whole contract extension for him? Yeah, truth be told, I've always been a Blake Bortles fan. Um, however, after 2016, I, I, I was about to close the, the book on him, right? <laughs> but I think 2017 uh, showed us a few things. So if I look back over the course of his career, you know, they talked about not playing his rookie season. Of course, then he gets thrown in there. I think the offensive line gave up 70 sacks that year. Then the next year, 50 sacks. So if you're if you're a young quarterback going through multiple coordinators, you're running for your life. You don't have much of a running game. Um, I think that's just a recipe to to lose your confidence. And I think he's I think he's on the pathway of having regained some this year, and is only going to be better. So uh, I'm a Blake Bortles fan, and you know one of the things that I that I watch in his game that says something to me is when he runs the ball, he doesn't slide. He, he, he either jumps over people or he tries to run them. Now, that's probably not the smartest thing to do, but I think he's showing to the fan that he really does care about this team, and I think he's earned this uh, three-year extension. Yeah, I mean, and if he's, the perfect thing about what you're saying is the Bills game. I mean, the passing mm -hmm. game wasn't really working out for him. You saw him out there running. I mean, he was lowering yep. his shoulders. He was juking people out. I mean, I think the funniest play of that game was when he dropped back and dropped the ball. Then he picked it back up and ran. Yeah. I just saw coaches on the sidelines just throwing down their clipboards and – it, it was really funny. So next I want to ask you, when it comes to 2018, what are your expectations for the team this upcoming season? Yeah, you know, let me, just, let me go back to 2017. You know, 10-6 and six was a shocker. Um, and it's funny because when I look over the 2017 season, they lost games they should have won. Okay, you should beat the Jets, you should beat the Cardinals, and you probably should have beaten the 49ers. And they lost those games, but then they won games that you didn't think they were going to the home owner, home, home, home opener against the Titans after they came off the hurricane and all that kind of stuff. I mean, Steelers. So this year, I would I'd at least look for at least that same record, but win games that you're supposed to win. And the rule of thumb in the NFL is that, hey, you win all eight of your home games, right? Which I think they can do, even with the Patriots coming in here early in September. Um, and then you go fifty, you go fifty fifty on um, the road game. So that's a twelve and four season. So I'd be fine with ten and six, twelve and four. I mean, you could even get in with a nine and seven. Yeah. Like you know, or you, one of your earlier interviews, you talked about, hey, just get into the playoffs. Whatever yeah. it takes, get in the playoffs, and then it's you know, we'll see. We go, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah, I mean, you so, saw at the beginning of the season uh, last year, they were really trying to find ways to win. I mean, they were yeah. win loss. They started off three and three and. They were just trying to find out ways to win, and all of a sudden it started clicking, yep. and they started stacking victories together for you. For the longest time, we're like, this team needs back-to-back -back wins. Like, you can't have a winning record if you don't have a pair of back-to-back -back wins. Right, so. this is true. And also, the last question I kind of want to ask you is, 
there's a lot of people and players and just media people talk about how terrible of a city Jacksonville is and you know a lot of it is just ignorant statements but you look around you see guys you know like Brunel Tony Baselli, those guys are from the West Coast. You're from the Northeast, and you settled down here, it looks like. So uh, what is it about Jacksonville that really appeals to a lot of former players that come down here? Yeah, I think it's. I think there's a couple things. I think Jacksonville has a lot to offer in terms of recreational type things. I mean, you got the St. John's River. you got the Intercoastal. you got the beaches. Uh, it's really kind of a diverse city. And yet it's, 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 it's a big city, but it's not a Miami. It's not South Florida. Um, and I think it's just it's conducive to raising a family. I tell everybody, I say, you know, my wife, I have three girls. We wouldn't want to live anywhere else. I mean, we love this city, and I think it's like to your point. A lot of the guys that I played with, or even guys after me, have made Jacksonville their home. And so, maybe it's not known to the rest of the nation. You know, they think we're a small market, but that's just fine by me. Let's just keep it a well kept secret because the Jaguars aren't going anywhere, and a lot of us have made this our home. Awesome. Well, that's Greg Huntington, the Mangler. Thanks so much for stopping by. Great being here. Last name ever, first name greatest, like a sprained ankle, boy.